finding the right support team, um, and in, <laughs> in my day, it was really just the coach. Nowadays, it's a coach, an agent, a manager, and there's all sorts of people behind you. Is, is so important to being able to go and do your job. I was very fortunate that I had the most incredible family support, which was the, the base, you know, without that, it doesn't matter how much money you've got, you can't buy anything else, you need a base. And then you have to have a coach who you trust and somebody who not will tell you what you want to hear, but tell you what you need to hear at all times. And what was so great about Carlo and Krista was that they never um, dealt with you as if they had magic wands. They just had information that they could pass on to you. And as, as a student of theirs, what was great was that the information they passed on to me was passed on in the way I needed to hear it, which was different than the way they gave it to Scott Hamilton in his early career, or Susan Driano, the Italian champion, or any one of the other people that they had working there. It wasn't a formulaic, this is how I teach it, this is what you do. It was always tailored individually to the skater's needs. Um, some of us were a little more vulnerable, we needed a little more coaching or caring moments, in which case Carla would say, oh, Krista, you take him, I'm sick of him today. I mean, and it was, again, their own personal family involvement family first, skating second, same as everybody else with my family. So there was a meeting of the minds. And I think from the very first time that I sat with Carlo in Tokyo at the World Championships where he was looking after me because my coach couldn't get to the championships, you know, it was a question of finding out whether we even liked each other or could get along. Um, and for me, the important relationship in growing up with my skating coach in England, with Pam, was it was very much a friendship and a trust factor in somebody that you completely believed and supported you and you would do anything for and vice versa. And I really felt that with Carlo. Sometimes we didn't agree and that was great because we both had our own ideas. Um, but out of that disagreement came a common ground that gave us something and, uh, and me something in my performances that I was hoping other people wouldn't have. And again, we were allowed to grow, which is why I think most of Carlo's students might have had all the same philosophies and ideas, but we never actually looked the same when we were on the ice. We all had our individuality, which was very important to him to maintain, even though he probably had six or seven people competing against each other in the same event. Carlo always maintained that I was very fortunate, I was given an incredible grounding, and I know I was. I was taught by somebody who cared about the quality of the, and the aesthetics of what I did, not only what I did. So while my early competitors were doing doubles and triples, even trying triples, I was still on singles and some doubles. I learned steps in both directions. She was a nice dancer and not a free skater. So the quality of what we did was instilled in me since I was seven or eight years old. It was always quality, not quantity. And that was one thing that, that Carlo always knew with me, was it was never about what I did, it's how I did it. And that's what made me different. And allowing me to continue to pick my music, to decide how I wanted to look, you know, and the whole idea of the disco music, which I suppose in 1980 everybody thought was quite, you know, was a big breakthrough. Now I look at it and it makes me cringe, but, you know, he was the one who said, it doesn't matter what they think, look what they said about John Curry four years ago, and I tell you the same thing I said to him. You can do what you want, but just make sure you do it right, because if it doesn't work, they're going to nail you. And it's, you know, this is what turns you on for an exhibition. This is what people love to watch you do. Then this is what you need to do to compete with. And it was met with quite a lot of resistance, certainly from the British Association at the time, was that, oh, that's really not proper, not correct. And I thought, great, that's the exact reason to do it. But as Carla maintained, if you don't deliver, don't expect the reward. You know, and it was that, it was, it was, Groundbreaking in some respect, but for me, I knew that's exactly what I had to do. It was, you know, all or nothing because I needed to try to express something. And whilst John Curry and I were nothing alike, we had nothing in common other than the boots and the blades and what we skated on. I was lucky having grown up watching him and thinking, if he can do it his way, I can do it my way. And I didn't think my way was anywhere near sort of um, off the wall. Why people would assume classical ballet on ice and skating the way John did was off the wall, but people did look at it oddly, even in the same way that they looked at what Toller Cranston did as being somewhat different. That was the reason to skate for me, the people that were different. Because why would you want to be like everybody else? Which is now kind of why I'm waiting to see how the new system falls into place, because all of a sudden what we're half finding is that there are a lot of people who are saying, well, these are the spins that give you those, that, mathematical points that we're all doing, and everyone seems to now be doing 
the same elements, they're going after the same points and the same things. So the individuality is, is a, for me, a little bit lost at the moment. I think people are trying to find their, their way with the new system. I have a very, and had, and still do when I'm teaching or talking to anybody, a very simple philosophy about skating because I was a very nervous competitor. I used to hate competition, but I loved to perform. Couldn't wait to get in front of an audience, hated the judges. But as Carlo pointed out, the judges are there for free. The audience are the ones who are paid, and they're fans of you and the skaters who want to come and see. Perform for, and he always said, perform for them. Make the judges think they're missing something. And it was, you know, the old philosophy of telling young children, you know, imagine the judges sitting in their underwear and fully knickers and when they make it, ha ha, and it just takes that edge off it. You have to try to be able to do that. And, you know, it's, I think if I ever set foot on the ice at a competition thinking, oh my God, there are 12,000 in this arena and 30 million watching at home, you would just stand there and, and nothing would happen. There is something about that adrenaline kick and those three hours between them calling your name and the music starting. And I've no, I don't want anybody ever to tell me it's only five seconds because it is three hours. And it's that moment. But then that music starts and you hit your comfort zone of this is what you're here for. You're there to show off and have a great time. And it can never be for me about landing a triple-triple combination. It's all about presenting a package. And that continues now, whether I'm working on a short program for a skater or a two-hour ice show. It's the entire package and what people go away feeling from your performance. Sometimes those people are nine judges that are sitting there, you know, working on a keypad and sometimes it's just an audience sitting at home. But if you can make it all about you, and again the philosophy is not trying to go out there to beat anybody, just to go out and do what you do best and what you try to do. If you go out and say, I've got to go and beat James this week or I've got to beat Susie next week, someone, that's great, you go beat both those people and then next week someone else comes along and beats you both. So you've achieved nothing. If you say, well, last time I fell on my triple and or this time I didn't quite get the audience at that point, I want to do, you know, give, always give yourself a reason to pat yourself on the back. And that was the other thing with Carlo and, and maybe a little more with Krista was about the aesthetics of it, is that we're in the business to feel good about it. And I want you to come off the ice knowing that you've done the best you can. And my mother's greatest line of all was, I don't care what happens, go onto the ice and come off in the same way in one piece and that's all I worry about. And with, a, with it being put as simply as that, it was a lot easy, well maybe a lot easier then, to deal with than maybe people have now. I mean, I could have quit the night before the Olympics and the only people that would have gone, oh well, would have been Carlo and my parents. You know, I didn't have agents or managers or contracts. There was no other reason to be there than I wanted to be there. You know, and things change as things evolve. And obviously, skaters are under different conditions now. But um, I only ever put my skates on because I wanted to, never because I've had to. And I've had 40 years of that, so I'm very happy. The short program is, I remember, is probably being one of the highlights of my career. Certainly from a moment of stepping on the ice and just knowing it's right. You can't explain it, you can't buy it, you can't, it's just the skates are on the right time, the music hits and you have one of those, and it was, it was, it was probably as, as good as I could have asked for it for any event ever, ever, as a, as a moment in time. Then you have that, at that time, unusual day off, the day of nothing. And I remember walking around Lake Placid at that time with my brother and my, my mother and my father and, and just people being enthusiastic and supportive. And I'm thinking, you know, I have an East German, a Russian, an American, you know, who are, who are sort of rivals. And um, whilst I had spent time in Denver training and certainly knew Charlie very well, everybody else, I, thought I, I, I was, I have to say, rather taken aback and very honored by the support that, that was being offered on that day off as I wandered around Lake Placid. Uh, but skating fans are, are funny. It's not, I wish you well and I hope they fall over. They wish everybody well. They all have their favorites, but they love skating. So, you know, they just want everybody to do well. I hope it, you know, hope works out. You know, they never tell you. I hope it works out for you, but I hope it works out for my boy better. So, the, you know, that, that feeling of support that day. And, and coming into Olympics, I'd have, I'd had flu, so I'd have four, three or four days off. 
and it just suddenly felt like it just worked. Everything seemed to happen at the time. And again, going back to my philosophy about it's not what you do, it's how you do it. Having had the mistake happen at the beginning of the long program and I thought I have four and a half minutes left to either make up for the mistake or ignore it and just fly onwards. And of course the performer in me <laughs> flew onwards. And whilst I will never forget that mistake, if I had allowed that mistake to cloud the next four minutes of my performance, I wouldn't have even been close to being on that podium. I skated first of the final eight, and if you asked me what the other seven did, I couldn't tell you because I went in next door and watched the American ladies team practice. I had no idea what had happened. I had no idea to this day who skated what, how they did. I was one of those people who could not watch another competitor or want to hear their results. Other people sit there all night going goo goo. The one thing I had to do was watch the pairs short and long program because I was fascinated by pair skating and, and have a secret love to be a pair skater. Um, and watch other people practice because I, watched, I love watching other people have fun at what they do. But I'm not a good competitor, I don't like to watch. It, not that you can do anything about the result you can't do. But um, I was actually watching the ladies when my brother came and found me to tell me the event was all over. And in fact, he didn't know that I didn't know that, I had, that I'd won. Because he had run up to the booth where the BBC were to get, see the results as it came up. Um, and I think what was great was you find those times when you have three or four or even five competitors who are on any given day capable of becoming a world or Olympic or European champion, whatever it would be, or a club champion. And it's what you do on that day. And I know that how I skated was different, but I also know that Hoffman was an incredible technician, that Charlie was a performer of great style and quality. And the next day, the same scenario, who knows? Or the day after, who knows? Um, we all strive to be the best as we are. As we are. And there are days at a competition when you're at a club level when you think, I should have been first or second and you're fourth or fifth. And there are days when you're third or fourth or seventh and you think, hang on a minute, I could have been second, I should have been. But it is what it is and, it's, and we take what there is. And whilst we would love to be perfect all the time, there is no such thing as perfection. And I gave of my best that day and the judges did what they did. And I took it quite happily. Um, and went to Worlds. And it didn't happen the same way there, but I made up for the mistake. And the one thing I said when I went to Worlds was, I will skate a clean on program and make up for the way I felt I needed to skate in Lake Placid. So I did exactly what I set out to do in Dortmund. Had the long program performance of my career. And, you know, walked away with a silver medal that hangs as proudly as the gold medal from the Olympics. I've been lucky, I, you know, to have had a few. They are someone's version of, not perfection, I can't ever say a six is perfect. A six is, I mean, our old judging system was marked against the base mark of the night. I mean, we always said, you know, six had to be perfect, but sixes were given for an emotion. We are governed by emotions and we are you know, we sit in the theater and we are transported. We sit watching something and make, makes us cry, whether it's a movie or a performance, or whatever it is. And it's that emotion that will govern how you judge. And as much as judges are told, you know, you cannot be emotionally involved, you have to be. You have to be emotionally involved to give a second mark. You have to be smart to use that emotion to govern how well the first mark is given. They have to be intertwined. There cannot be, you cannot have unemotional judges. It can happen that people are not moved by that type of music and they have to go, well, you know what, the audience have got it. Again, if you're a good judge, you're going to go, it's not my cup of tea, but man, they did a good job at it. It really worked. And, you know, I have to reward that. You can't just say, well, I hated it. It doesn't, that doesn't work. People need a response. And we as performers want to have that. So, you know, getting that six means that you've moved somebody to a point where they were carried off by what you did. And that's the whole point of what I did. <laughs> Um, you know, I'm not, I, I never have discussed, well, you know, that leg could have been there. Or it's, it's about the whole package. And I probably, as a judge, if I was judging, would have given more sixes to people or five nines to people because of that emotional content. Because 
to me, in a performance, that's the stuff you can't buy. No judge, no coach, no money, no millions of billions of dollars can buy a performance that comes from the heart, that has to come from within the person. And when those moments happen, they are spectacular. I was in Salt Lake and I was commentating for the BBC and I'm huge fans of Beres Nye and Sigurlitsa. I just think there's, again, it's that it fact, you've either got it or you ain't, you can't buy it, you can't teach it, it's, they, they have it. Um, it was still there that night and it was, you know, it was a little cautious and again, there, it, it wasn't what we're used to seeing from them. So already people go, oh, it's not that, you know, it wasn't. And Jamie, um, Sally and Peltier had this moment, you know, which for them may not have connected with some people, connected with others. Again, it's, it's, it's not chalk and cheese, but you couldn't find two more different qualities of perfect pair skating than you have with the Canadians and the Russians. And that's a difference in styles and the teaching and the qualities. Um, I thought what Jamie and what they did that night was, was fantastic and to be able to deliver those goods that day. If I'd have been on the judging panel, very torn. Um, again, short program to me, no contest with the Russians, it was spectacular. Element for element, Canadians, package, heart. I don't, you know, I, I personally, as I was calling it there, went with the Russians, but I questioned my call and I questioned how the judges would, how it would go. But for all diff very different reasons than the actual outcome came. Um, and I think it's a question of, again, justification, being completely behind your emotional attachment to a certain style or a certain element, or being able to say, yes, well, yes, they lose points here, but they make it up here, or they lose this here, vice versa for, for whoever. And again, being in a position of power as the judges or the referee or whoever it, you have to, having worked your way through the judging system, to be able to stand up for your own judgment like an umpire in tennis or whoever. It may not be what the people want to hear, or the player, or the skater, whoever, but this is what I, how I saw it at the time. Regardless of playback or review, which they now have, which they didn't have in my day, you know, they don't have it in tennis, or whatever, it is, it's an instant call. It's human judgment, and we are in the business of human judgment, and human error. But again, it's the aftermath of how those judgments were made is what you realize, you know, maybe it isn't so much human errors, in fact, um, human intention. And those are two completely different emotions. I've often wanted, <laughs> probably a bit late now, to run a competition where the one person in charge was the referee, in the same way as an umpire sitting in a tennis match can call a line judge at the time it happens, or can make a decision. Because I've often thought, if we watched a Wimbledon or US Open final, and the referee took notes, and the umpire took notes, and didn't actually do anything at the time of the event, people would go, kind of bizarre. But that's how skating was being run at the time. The referee was in charge. But I, whether they were allowed, and again, I didn't, you know, I never went, because it never happened in my lifetime of skating. You never saw, if you never a short program and a referee making their notes going, ah, four tenths of deductions, ah, 5.8, uh, excuse me, hang on one second, I'll be right back. And actually then make that call instantaneously. The audience would know, oh, yeah, that doesn't look right. Or even before it goes up. Or in the event of a referee having gone through pretty much, I would have thought, 30 years of training from club level to international to juniors to senior to before you get to Olympic level, to be put in the position of the most powerful person in our sport at that event at that time, the same way as they are in other sports, the referee at the World Cup football final or the umpire at Wimbledon. These people have ultimate power and it is their decision, their word is God. And for that to happen in ice skating, or at least to have been tested, never happened. You know, a referee never called a judge on the deductions at the time they were happening, or maybe it should have been the referee who made the deductions, nobody else. The referee counts it up with their assistant. They know that there are nine tenths of deductions in that short program. We, as the judges, will put in our mark and we, what we thought it should be if it was perfect, which is, and then you deduct from that. 
and the referee will make the deduction. Similar to how it's happening now, the technical controller and the caller is deciding what level the deductions are and what the jump is. So I just wondered if the referee was actually given the jurisdiction to make that power call at the time they thought there was a problem and something was wrong. And obviously nobody wants to be called in front of 12,000 people or 15,000 people, so maybe if you didn't think you were going to get called on it, you wouldn't do it. For the person or the judge at the time to be able to go, no, I'm justifying my mark. This, 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 and this, and this. The referee goes, you know what? Okay, it's there and you've got it in your replay. I'll let you keep it. And then at least, again, the people watching the live, the audience or whatever, I mean, it's probably not great for TV because it's taking up time, but we're seeing out front in public our skating championship being run rather than everything happening after the fact. And not necessarily behind closed doors, but again, where people aren't in a position, you know, I should be able to, if I was a judge and a referee, I would be quite happy for someone to say, why did you give my kid that student? What's that mark? And I'll pull out my book because I'll tell you exactly why. I didn't like this, and they did this, and then no, end of story, that's it, you know. But I think it's the, the so-called secrecy factor of people never actually knowing what happens in a judges' meeting after an event. Why we're, of course, now it's in black and white. The one good thing about, you know, you can see your mark, you can see what you were scored on, you can see that you're only given a level two and you thought you were level four. That will help things and that will, that will move it forward, but it doesn't make it any, more, any easier for an audience to watch because it's going to take time now for them to get off the 5.960 and a first decimal point place to a total mark where they, and at the moment, skaters and people sitting at, uh, what does that mean? Where does that put me? At the same time, it's now up to the skaters to gear up on the paperwork and know exactly what it means when you sit in that kiss and cry and what it means compared to somebody else's ratio points and all that. I mean, we're all on a, lear a big learning curve with it. And I think, you know, a lot of us commentators are going to be having to try to do some explanations to people at the Olympics coming up in Torino because I know that our BBC audience are not clued into the new judging system. And there certainly isn't going to be time on the air to give them a rundown. So, you know, we're, the commentators are going to have a bit of a juggle job to do to explain about the skating and for me to commentate on what I've seen and whether it's good, bad or indifferent or whatever. But at the same time, try to give a little bit of an insight on how the new judging system is being used and utilized. And uh, it's not an easy task. It won't be easy. <sighs> um, I haven't seen enough of the events to really give an opinion on that. But having said that, I do know that the people who are required to go through the testing to become the controllers are people who have been there themselves. These are my peers, these are people I trained with, these are people I skated with. So these should be and are people I respect. And if I don't agree with the result, I will quite happily ask them why. Uh, so I think you know the difference in being is that these people are required to have been skaters, whereas an Olympic judge in the past was not. You could learn about judging, and there are many parents who start judging because their kids are at a club level and who learned the system and could learn and became very good judges, had never set foot on the ice in their lives. But the difference now is that the people, as far as I'm aware, the people controlling the triple this, the quadruple combination of that, and the quality of control people are people who have been there and done it. Now that, to me, does at least, and should at least, put people at ease that these people know and should know what they're doing. An interesting factor will be how the viewing audience now stick with the new judging system. They've gotten used to the fact that 5.4 means meh, 5.7 is mmm, 5.8, 5.9, fantastic, yeah, we, and we loved it too. Those three factors are gone from a viewing audience right now. They will sit there, as my mother would, not knowing one jump from the other and go, yeah, I really liked that program. I wasn't so keen on the music, but it was really nice, the package. And I wonder where they'll put them. Mm, I might think, you know, maybe a fourth or fifth. I liked it better than that last one. But they don't have that recognition to a judging mark. But again, being able to get comfortable with the new system, seeing how it goes, seeing the performances, knowing where the person, oh, that wasn't as good as their last person or best, this, like, this program better. Again, you like to be an armchair judge. 
I don't think that's going to change. I think people at home will always put themselves in that position. They just have to change how they did it. I think the program of the past, as Toller would have skated it, as John Curry would have skated it, as Brian Boitano would have skated it, and as I would have skated it, will not be seen. I think the amount of elements that need to be put into programs, the time it takes to do a very good serpentine step sequence is longer than, you know, you have more elements. There are things you have to get in there. You know, people will do a circle or a straight line because you can do the same amount of steps, you can get the points, you can do the pickup, and again, move on. I know some ice dancers are saying, you know, we don't have time just to do a blues chop to anymore because we've got to keep, it, it's that thing of having to keep moving to tot up the points. I don't think, you know, that landing of the jump and having that beautiful extension, you know, the, the Michel Kwan back spiral for three hours after the double axle is not going to happen because that's time you could be picking up points and elements and other things. I do think that it's going to take a little while for people to, to make a spin not 12 different positions and again we're getting to that point now where I'm seeing some of the ugliest things but because they can put themselves in that position they're gonna get points for it you know a beautiful camel to me a spin or a camel spin with no movement is much harder than changing every three revolutions uh, but that's not going to give you the you know again the accumulation of points that, that of how it works so it's finding you know the beautiful slow piece that allows you to skate to the music rather than have to use that 30, 45 seconds to have six elements in it. Um, I'm, I find it not odd, but it's just coming from my background and where I am now that transitions and ice coverage and skating skills and choreography are all one, to me, all one and the same. You can't do a transition without it being choreography. You can't do a field move without it being choreography. Part of the, my problem is I do a footwork sequence and I go, oh, I know that step. And I go, it's not a step, it's a bracket. It's a rocker or a chop tool. They've never been taught them as rockers, brackets, or chop tools. So they have no idea what they are. They have no concept of where they come from. So they don't know school figures. They don't know a loop. They don't know a double loop on the ice or, you know, an invert. You know, oh, I know that step. I can do that. Show me that again and I'll copy you. That, to me, makes me cringe because no one is being taught the craft anymore. And I will teach people figures just because they don't have to do it to compete. It doesn't mean they shouldn't do it, whether it's on a public session or, you know, they do field moves. But these field moves have a base. And to me, that base is what skating is all about. It's the understanding and the use of your blades and your edges. And when you put that together with music, I don't care what you call it, but the bottom line is the whole package is choreographed. An arm move is choreographed. A bracket into the mohawk, into your combination, is choreographed. All one and the same. There's not, to me, there are not four or five different components. Two or three, maybe, because one of them is all encompassing. And again, it's, you know, all this, to me, mishigosh, and probably my ignorance of having not had the time to go through every element and every part of what needs to be done. But again, it's, it's skating to me is very simple. You put the music on, you skate beautifully or as beautifully as you can, and in between that beautiful skating, you jump and twirl. I don't think it should be any more complex than that. And that's where the beauty is going to get lost if we don't just remember that skating is all about beauty and being able to feel beautiful and look great and look fabulous, whether you're doing a quad combination or a spiral. It's about the feeling of what you're doing when you're making that element happen. It shouldn't, shouldn't be in my book, and maybe again, I'm showing my age a little bit and, and the quality, and I don't differ anything from the level of expertise that we're seeing at these championships now. But for me, the bottom line is the beauty of stepping on the ice and doing what we do best, and that's movement with no movement. No one else in the world can do a move that will take you 15 miles an hour and not move a muscle. That's what I miss now, is the Janet Lynn element, the Dorothy Hamill, the Peggy Fleming, the Viktor Petrenkos. You know, Viktor Petrenkos, Olympic program of nothing for the first 45 minutes, 45 seconds, except exquisite skating into a triple axel. I would gasp to see that again now.
I think the challenge is being different. Knowing that everybody has to do a quad triple combination, everybody has to do two triple axles, everybody's going to do four spin combination changes. I mean, you know, it's written there in black and white what you need and what the requirements are. And I, I would hate to say it, but it might be the time that we are now reversing a fortune and it's now not how you do it, it is what you do. How you do it will help, but how you do it won't, won't help you win. And that's the difference at this point in time, I think. Uh, but when you look at Lambiel, who to me skates in such a way that he shouldn't be required to have three quads and four trip, whatever it is, because nobody can skate like that, nobody can spin like that, and he's going to lose those qualities that make him special are the things that he's going to lose because he's too busy trying to keep up with the Joneses on the rest of the stuff. And that to me is, um, if it goes in that direction, if it continues that type of trend, for me, unforgivable. I think when you run an organization, if you have the passion for what you have within your organization, you can do anything. But if you're not passionate about what the skaters' needs are, whether they're on speed skates or figure skates, then you can't be involved in that organization. I hope that there are people in the ISU who love skating. I know that the people that were around in my day, that's the only reason we were in it. There was no other reason to do it. Why would you want to be involved? It doesn't pay anything. You know, we did it because we wanted and we loved it. You know, but again, times change and things move on and, and there has to be change and we have to move with change and times change. Um, but I would, I would hate to think that anybody was ever involved in something like this, in a figure skating sport, at whatever, any sport, any job at any level, because they have to do it rather than want to or love to do it. And again, I, I to this day have never put my skates on because I've had to, I've only ever put them on because I wanted to. And I will, until the day I drop dead, that will be the philosophy and no one will tell me otherwise. I just, I think, again, it's that. These people were governed by their hearts, primarily and brains, secondarily, maybe. You know, it was, it was, this is not, this is, you know, it was a passion thing. Um, and they did it because they love their sport and they love what they want to do. I don't think it was intended, and I, from my point of view, it's certain, and my support of them, it wasn't intended to be, I support you, which means I don't like you. It was, I support you because I get it, and I get what you want, and I'm not really getting what, is being offered in return. I'm not, I don't, you know, I, I couldn't at that point buy into. And I thought something, and something did need to be done. You know, the sport and the thing that, that made me tick and makes me get up in the morning was being ridiculed by my friends and people that I respected. And I thought, I, I want to be somehow, I don't want to be held accountable for what's happening around, but I want to be accountable for what can maybe happen in the future and be a part of that. You know, as an Olympian, as a, a person who, again, loves the skating and didn't want to see things fall apart, you know, and you try to do what you can do. How people see you after that is really up to them. Um, you know, my life does not revolve around being involved, eligible or ineligible, to the International Skating Union or, you know, competitions or Olympics. I'm very fortunate that my life can revolve around people who love to perform on the ice. And occasionally, my paths cross with the other world when I get to commentate on the events. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm in a different position than other people. Maybe I, I could speak up because it doesn't make any difference to me. But I, but I want to be liked and I want people to understand that my opinions are because I love my sport and I love what I do. We have that ability to debate these options and how it's out there. And I, and I think, you know, the grey area is okay. It doesn't have to be black and white. It can't be. It can be grey area. And there are ways that things can evolve into becoming what they are. And I'm hoping that somehow differences of opinion can be accepted. 
And, you know, again, I'm not going to like everything they say or they're not like everything I say, whether it's about making a cheese souffle or, you know, the latest pop music. You can't always agree, but you can agree to disagree and respect someone else's opinion. And that's the most important thing in our sport. It was losing respect. And it's time for people to understand that not everybody will agree. Not everybody likes the new system. But what is, is. And let's agree to disagree and respect each other's opinions. And let's see what we can do to put our sport back where it belongs. And that's on the TV for all the right reasons. Highlights of my career, I think, um, probably performing in my first European Championship <laughs> at a very young teenager, completely green, and standing on practice ice next to Sergei Chetvarukin, who had any ever seen on television, thinking, oh my God. And then, I suppose, jumping to the other end of the spectrum and, and finishing that long program in Dortmund and going, I'm done. It can't get any better than this. This is my pro career starting now. I'm, I'm done. Um, and knowing that I had that coming at the end of that long program. And again, it was Carlo who in his head knew before I started my long program that I couldn't win. And he said, it's done. It's over. You can't win. Just go have a good time. This is your chance to skate for these people. And that's what I did, and that was, that was that moment. And I think highlights of other people, because I was inspired by them. Ronnie Shaver's short program to reviewing the situation. Wonderful, perfect piece of choreographic genius at the time. Taller, anything. <laughs> he stepped on the ice because of just the balls and the power with which he commanded your attention. That allowed me to do the same. And John Curry too. And sitting there in Innsbruck having, you know, done my bit and skated quite well. And then to be very proudly standing with the rest of the British team in the vomitry of the arena as John just had that wonderful moment. Um, my all-time greats, Rodnina and Zaitsev. Actually, Rodnina and anybody. Um, because, again, it was Russian and proud and commanding, but she never once set foot on the ice without commitment and a passion to her sport. And again, she just lived and breathed skating. And it's in, it was there and that was, that was, they were my inspiration when I would go and watch the pairs long program and watch the pairs at a European championship, wherever it was when I was first starting. And this is, you know, the East Germans were there and they were doing their thing, but Rodnina, man, that woman just on the ice going around, just thinking that's, I know that she feels how I feel when I skate, and that's the connection you make. Um, and she became a great friend, but it was, it was their performances that, that were inspiration to me when I was a kid. I think Olympics Nagano was a great example of that emotion taking place. Michelle had something to prove. Tara, at the time, had really nothing to prove. Uh, there was that, for me, a little feeling of safety with what Michelle was doing. The quality was unquestionable. She always was great. And I think people who sat and watched it on TV would have gone, hmm, not really sure. You were in that building that night, and you felt that spark that Tara gave off live, that you can't transfer through TV, you can't. Again, it's that it thing. That moment happened. What some of us predicted and could possibly was seeing bubbling happening in practice showed up that night. And on that moment in time, there was no question that Tara just had, she had her moment in time. And you can't explain it. You can't not be governed by it. And you are completely, and I was, and I allowed myself to be completely taken along with it. I loved, I've always loved Michelle, and there's such a, an air of grace and a quality about her, but that was overtaken that night by the sheer spunk and spontaneity of Tara Lipinski. And it's that magic moment, it's not what you do, it's how you do it, and when you do it. For Nancy to be able to even get on the ice, and go took some 
willpower and emotional connection. And again, she has that from her family background and, and how she was. And again, to deliver with the brain that night, more so than her heart. Nancy was always a very good technical and a brain skater, but she was also from the heart. Oksana was just out there and nobody expected anything. It was, it was kind of a similarity in, in the building at that moment between uh, Tara and Michelle and the way it worked out with Nancy and Oksana. It was a, you know, this elfin little thing came flying out the gate like a little greyhound, gazelle, bouncing and flying. And we'd seen it in practice, but certainly hadn't seen it. And it delivered on the night. And, you know, it was, it was a very close call. It was a very close call. But again, as someone who delivers in their own performing, I went with the one who I could connect with, and I connected with Oksana Bayul that night. You know, it was, I was, I knew we'd never see it again. And that's why that, you can't, that moment, it was, and again, being there and feeling that excitement and being caught up with those people, you buy into it. And again, that's that emotional attachment. And, you know, that's what gives us a different opinion every time we step into a theater or into an ice rink or into a movie house, you know. We can never react the same twice. Katarina and Debbie, for me, there was never a question. They were just very, very different. And, you know, Katarina could command her audience and just put you under a spell. And if you were judge number one, judge number nine, male, female, whoever, just walking off the street, you were under the spell. That was it. The Battle of the Bryans, I've, I've found very different. For me, and I've told him this, nobody told Brian Orser that even with a mistake, he was still capable of winning. If someone had, if I had done with me and internalized after that mistake in Lake Placid, I would never have won. As I said, I would have been fourth or fifth. I saw Brian perform, and, and he can correct me, and I, and I could be wrong, completely wrong, but I saw Brian personally make that mistake and play it over in his brain as he continued to go through the program. I never once saw it dismissed and, and move on. And that pulled that Brian Orser spontaneity back and made him not clinical. I can't say it was clinical at all because neither he nor Brian Boitano were ever clinical. But for me, that Orser edge went. And instead of cranking it that bit further, and not compensating or overcompensating, we should never compensate for a mistake we've made. All you can do is put it out of the way and move on and, and just make the rest even better. And, and that isn't, a, for me, that isn't compensation, that's just upping your game. And Brian Boitano, oblivious or otherwise to what had gone on, just, you know, was doing his thing. And, and again, in the building on the night, that's how it happens. And that's, you have good competitors and you have great competitors. And you have those people that will win and those people that won't. But it doesn't make them any better or any worse than other people. And, you know, if they had both arrived at another time, it would have been different. You know, and we've seen a lot of great skaters, Brian Orser, Toller Cranston, who you would have think, yeah, their name could have been on an Olympic podium somewhere, quite happily. Didn't happen. But then Brian's got a world title that I never had. I think the importance for me is to be able to see skating in the future calm down. And by calming down, I mean to a point where the, the competitors of now will still have bodies that will allow them to skate in 10 years time or 15 years time. Scott, myself, Dorothy, we had 15, 20 years of performing, obviously not at Olympic level, but performing in a way that we felt we couldn't put ourselves in front of an audience. We watch skaters now dissipate after three or four very grueling competitive years through injury and health. And I, and I have to say, what was science fiction in my day is now expected from a junior man, or a junior lady for that matter. So I would love them to be able to get that point where there's a comfort factor in what we're seeing, where we're not edge of the seat every moment for a quad this and a quad that, and people talking about five revolutions, and pairs feeling they have to do a throw quad and a, you know and the upside and the you know I would like it just to calm down and again get back to the grace of what we can do on the ice and the movement we have 
with no movement and and allow the skaters to to express in a way that we were expected to and uh, yeah I don't think skating is going away anytime soon and I hope it, it won't and I think it has no choice it has to calm down but um, I just hope people will continue to enjoy watching it and love it for all the right reasons. <laughs>